Hello, um, good evening. Uh, my name's Elizabeth Towner. Um, I, uh, I now live in Norham in North Northumberland and I retired from my post um, as professor, professor of child health in, uh, in Bristol uh, about eight years ago. But before that, I worked at Newcastle University for a number of years. But my interests, um, in the natural environment go back quite a long way, perhaps to my first degree in geography that I did at the University of Durham. So to, today, uh, today what I'm doing is to talk about uh, a commemorating the bicentenary of a botanical artist of the border counties. Uh, her name is Margaret Rebecca Dickinson, and she's got a vast visual legacy that she's left to us. Who was, who was uh, Margaret Becker Dickinson and why is she being commemorate, commemorated this year in 2021? Well, Margaret was a very talented and prolific botanical artist. Um, a lot of her uh, paintings uh, are now in the Hancock Museum. So they're very close to, to where you are in Newcastle. Uh, Margaret was born in Newcastle uh, in July 1821, and she died uh, just over a century ago in December 1918. So she had a very long lifespan. I mean, that was she was born just be, uh, six years after the Battle of Waterloo, and uh, and uh, died just a month after the end of the First World War. So in that period of time. There were huge amounts of changes happening in Newcastle, the rest of Northumberland and the country. And her life and uh, her work on her botanical art uh, reflect some of this. We're going to be commemorating her this year because 2021 is the bicentenary of her birth. And she produced paintings dating from the 1840s when she was in her 20s right up to the 1890s. Now she lived in Newcastle, near, in Gattonside, very near Melrose and Norham, and she painted the wildflowers and the cultivated flowers of those areas. Now, although she produced a huge number of uh, paintings uh, and uh, drawings, uh, unfortunately, there's no photo or painting of, of Margaret Dickinson that we could find at all. But I think this photograph here of a field club ex excursion for the Liverpool Naturalist Club in 1860 might sort of give some idea of how she might have looked and how she might have dressed on a field excursion. This visual legacy of Margaret Dickinson is huge, as I said earlier. And uh, a lot of them are housed in the Natural History Society of Northumbria, the Hancock Museum, where there's a collection of 458 of her wildflower drawings. But there's also a smaller collection, and this is at the Lindley Library in London, where there's an album 
of 30 Narcissus drawings. Um, now the two different ones, the, the Hancock um, uh, collection of wildflowers uh, was a donation, uh, was a bequest that Margaret made uh, on her death and went to the Hancock Museum in uh, 18, nine, uh, 1918. Um, and the Lindley collection uh, was, uh, was, uh, was purchased by the Royal Horticultural Society at an auction um, in uh, 1996. So one is the bequest, the other one is a, is a purchase. Just to find out a bit more, uh, very briefly, about Margaret's family background. Um, as I said earlier, she was born uh, in Newcastle, uh, very close to the quayside. Her parents were called William Ogle Dickinson, um, and her mother was uh, Elizabeth Dickinson, nay Davidson. Um, Margaret was the oldest of five children, and all five of them uh, were born in the in the 1820s, as you can see here. Um, the uh, four, four, uh, four sisters and one brother. Uh, both Margaret and the next sister along, Rebecca Ann, uh, neither of them married. The other two sisters, Elizabeth and Anne Logan, uh, did marry and so did George. You can see at the bottom here, part of an almanac for the family firm, which was called Dickinson Tobacco Manufacturers. Um, and this was an almanac in uh, 1878. If you look at the big picture of the almanac here, um, in 1878, the firm was owned by um, um, Margaret Rebecca Dickinson's brother, uh, George. Um, and you can see here from the very big um, almanac that was produced for the family firm, uh, that the tobacco works was established in 1740 at the head of the side in Newcastle. Um, and there were, there were um, four main generations that, uh, uh, that owned the tobacco firm. Uh, the first one was the grandfather of, sorry, the great grandfather of um, Margaret Dickinson, George. Uh, the second one was the son of George, the father of Elizabeth Davidson. The third owner was William Ogle, who was the son-in-law of John and the um, father of Margaret Dickinson. And lastly, her brother, George, who owned the firm when the father retired. Uh, but you can see here there were cigars, there were snuffs, tobacco, and it was really a very, um, uh, very uh, prosperous firm. And both the, uh, the oldest sisters, Margaret and Rebecca, neither of them uh, had to, uh, worked for their living. Uh, in all the censuses, they appeared um, you know, of independent means. So this, was, this meant that Margaret had the time and the money and the resources to be able to pursue her lifelong hobby. Well, what about uh, what happened um, uh, to the, 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 the firm itself? Um, the Dickinson family didn't, didn't appear to have any uh, particular associations uh, in Newcastle with either naturalist or with artists in their own social circle. But for a young woman like Margaret, she had opportunities to study both botany and art within very close range of her homes. Um, she uh, studying botany, uh, for example, we haven't got the, the precise information about where she studied botany or where she studied art, but these were some of the opportunities that were available. Uh, in the centre of Newcastle. One was um, uh, Sir William Hooker, uh, who was um, Professor of Botany at Glasgow University, delivered 12 evening lectures in botany at the Lytton Phil for a general audience in 1837, 
at the time when Margaret would have been uh, about uh, 16 or so. The following year, there was a summer course at the School of Medicine and Surgery at Newcastle. Um, and uh, this summer course also included practical uh, botany and botanizing excursions. Uh, we can see also part of the Margaret's bequest uh, when she died to the Hancock Museum was for her, for her copy of Hooker's British Flora. And on the uh, right hand side of the screen here, you can see her, her copy that she had and that she annotated and that she used very frequently. In relation to art classes, uh, the Newcastle was also very well provided for, uh, for art classes and the new government school of art and design um, uh, that, that developed. Um, there were ladies private classes which included both flower painting and outline shading which were very good sort of background for somebody with the interest that, that Margaret Dickinson had. So that, that was the sort of the, the, um, the sort of background to all of this. So the wildflower connect, uh, collection that I talked about earlier in one of the earlier slides, the wildflower collection um, of 458 wildflowers that Margaret collected. This is a map trying to show some of the main places where uh, Miss Dickinson collected her specimens and there, there were three main areas one uh, was in and around uh, in and around Newcastle itself uh, there was then in and around Gatton side near Melrose uh, uh, up across the borders into Scotland and thirdly in and around Norham so those were the main areas but there was also quite a number of areas where she collected in the rest of Northumberland and then in other places, there was Upper Teesdale, where she collected some of the Teesdale rarities and various other parts of the country. For example, uh, there's some places where she collected more than 10 specimens, included Wetherill, uh, where there's the, uh, the W on the map, um, along the Tyne Valley. Uh, south of Newcastle, there was both York and Scarborough. Um, marked with the Y and the S on the coast there. And then down uh, in the south, there were also a number of specimen collected at Sirencester, with smaller amounts, as you can see, uh, in Kent, and then down in um, uh, uh, Devon, uh, and one or two places in Ireland and the far north of Scotland. So she did, she did have the means to travel widely and to collect some of her different uh, botanical samples from many places. Uh, but to start off with, um, so I'm going to look initially at some of the samples that she collected in and around Newcastle. Uh, and <clears throat> here, the first uh, of, the, uh, of her specimen was collected just outside Newcastle in the very diverse wetland habitat of Prestwick Carr. Now this is very much uh, located near where Newcastle Airport is today, uh, but, and it's between uh, Pontyland and Dinnington. But in the 1840s, the Prestwick Carr was very, very much bigger and had a very diverse wetland habitat of mere and open fen, car and raised bog. But there was, there were, during the 1850s, a lot of the car was drained for agricultural use, leaving it as a very much diminished spot. Um, earlier in the, uh, in the 1840s, Prestwick car was a renowned beauty spot. And there's a very good study that Barbara Harbottle did um, of the detailed history of the car and the impact that both drainage and agricultural improvements had on the, uh, the, both the flora and fauna uh, of the whole of the car. 
uh, the, uh, she quotes a local schoolmaster uh, where the area was a tremendous source of personal delight for him as a naturalist, but both for its botanical specimens uh, and for its bird life, etc. Now, this is uh, one of the first of uh, Margaret's um, uh, draw, uh, paintings. This is of Marsh Andromeda, uh, now known as Bog Rosemary. And she collected this in 1850 from Prestwick Carr. And we know that this, today there's only a very small relict colony on this raised bog in the Scots Pine Plantation there, uh, uh, quoted by Swan in 1993. This is one of the other specimens she collects there, again in 1850 um, at Prestwick Carr. And this is very rare now in South Northumberland. And the, these sundews are insectivorous plants, uh, commonly found in acid peat bogs and damp moorlands. Um, a lot of the, uh, the commentary on the different specimens here are from, um, uh, are from the archives records um, uh, in the Hancock Museum. And uh, so the uh, all the uh, these uh, images are illustrated by the comments that were that were collected together uh, when the materials were first digitized. Um, secondly, as well as immediately around Newcastle, Margaret Dickinson also traveled along the Tyne Valley. This was a time when the railway line uh, uh, railways were spreading very much from uh, across the country. So it was possible for Margaret to get uh, to many places from Newcastle along the Tyne Valley. And this was her, her one picture that she did of a wild daffodil, um, Narcissus pseudo uh, Narcissus, which she collected near Shotley, not far from Shotley Bridge. Um, so this was, um, uh, on the banks, Chotley was on the banks of the River Derwent, and uh, wild daffodils are still found as a native species at Allenford, about five miles from Chotley Bridge. To collect some specimens uh, within the, uh, the town of Newcastle itself at that time, because there was a lot of public open space that was available. Uh, in the 1840s, 50s onwards. Uh, this was um, a specimen here, Autumn Hawk, hawk Bit, uh, which she collected on the town moor in Newcastle in 1855. This was the time when the race course was also on the town moor uh, in Newcastle. And there were many other localities uh, where she collected at Scotswood, the North Road, Gosforth Lane, where a number of fairly common species were available. She collected them and later uh, did her, uh, her paintings of them. Uh, but she also travelled around Newcastle uh, to the coast. Uh, she was drawn very much to the open spaces of the coasts, uh, both north of the Tyne and south of the Tyne. Um, this was a time uh, when uh, the, there were increasing numbers of people going to the coast from the town itself for leisure. And as time went on, the rail services made the journey very much easier for all, with a huge station opening in Tynemouth. Uh, you can see here, one of the specimens is of Lesser Celandine uh, on the left. And you can see a very delicate portrait of, the, uh, of this, uh, this specimen here. On the right, there's um, Thrift or Sea Pink, uh, Armeria Maritima, and this was collected at Whitley Bay um, in 1849. So the end of the 40s, early 50s, she was doing quite a lot of collection in, in these areas. And then, South of the time as well, uh, she collected 
uh, in a number of, of places. Uh, she collected specimens from Marsden and Whitburn and Bolden and Sunderland. Because uh, this was a time when there were ferries across the time. So it was easy to get by train and then ferry to some of the different places uh, on the coast. Um, it, through, through many years of her life, Margaret appears to have a fascination with orchids. It was a time when both um, exotic orchids were coming in, being brought in from many countries around the world. And um, botanists were also looking for um, native orchids uh, within the British Isles itself. Um, she collected a number in different parts of the country, up in Scotland and in Kent um, and um, uh, in, in many, many other parts of the country as well. But these were two specimens that she collected um, from Marsden uh, in County Durham uh, in 1852. So these were, um, the, these were from uh, the uh, found on magnesian limestone deposits um, in this area near uh, near Marsden, and uh, they the bee orchid, for example, on the the right here, uh, is uh, a native plant often found on limestone grassland and cal calcareous fixed dunes, um, and here it's in the northern part of it, its its general generally where it's found. But you can see the, the, the little bee orchids on the right there. Um, and the flowers, and this had a fascination for many botanists at that time, and quite a number were dug up and, and, and uh, grown in gardens, etc. So I think with a lot of the botanizing that was going on, there, was, there were quite some concerns amongst botanists at the time uh, about the, um, the loss of some of the species at that particular time. Uh, towards the end of the 1850s, uh, the Dickinson family um, moved uh, up to uh, Gattonside, which is just to the north of Melrose um, on, the river, on the River Tweed. Um, William Dickinson, at this stage had retired from his job um, as a manufacturer of tobaccos. And he and his wife, Elizabeth, and the two older, uh, older daughters who were still si si single uh, women at this time, moved to a house called Friars Hall in Gattonside. Um, at this time, Gattonside was described by the buildings of Scotland as one of the most brilliant landscapes in Scotland, with houses surrounded by orchards, a beautiful position with uh, views to the south, looking over, uh, over towards the Melrose size of the, of the Tweed. And the, below here, you can see a description from the Ordnance Survey name book for Roxburghshire, when the first edition of the Ordnance Survey maps were being prepared. And there's a, a, a very nice description of the, this place has a very picturesque appearance when viewed from the Melrose side of the Tweed. It looks like a large wood with a great number of houses thrown indiscriminately among the trees. So a really very pleasant spot uh, for, uh, for the family to spend their, uh, uh, the parents to spend their retirement. And there were a number of occupations. Margaret was the, the, still a very keen botanist, uh, but the, I think all the family were keen on horticulture and went to local horticultural shows. And the father, William, was also a keen fisherman. And he, here he found the Tweed was very well stocked with fish in the, um, in the uh, 1860s. And there is a newspaper report in 1866 in November, where uh, William Dickinson is reported to have caught seven salmon, some of considerable weight, uh, in the Tweed very close to his house, 
So I think it appeared to be a time when perhaps all the family were really very enjoying their, their new place. And I think that um, Margaret uh, was, uh, there seemed to be a boost in the, uh, her collecting and going out to collect different specimens, both in the village of Gattonside uh, and at some of the nearby settlements, a place called Kittyfield, to just to the east of, the, of um, Gattonside, some specimen near the village itself. Uh, and that was at Gattonside, this lovely, very detailed picture of a foxglove was, collect, was collected in September 1861. And you can see the beautiful shading behind of the foxglove and how that is able to emphasize the three-dimensional aspect of, of this particular picture. It really uh, stands out from the background. Um, she also collected uh, other samples in the Eildons and Gattonside Moss uh, to the north of the village and some of the large estates um, uh, in the nearby area. Again, uh, like Preston, uh, Prestwick Carr, Margaret was drawn to another wetland and uh, she went to Gattonside Moss, which was uh, a, a, a very marshy portion of ground, five acres in extent, just to the north of Gattonside village. And people living in this area had for centuries the right to take peats and turf. But she collected there a sample, a specimen of needle uh, greenweed or petty whin, uh, Genista anglica. And she also collected some mountain uh, cudweed here. So quite a few samples from Gattonside Moss. Um, uh, she also went to some of the estates that were fairly e easily accessible in the borders. One of the other advantages of Gattonside as a location here, it was close to the railway station in Melrose, and you could get to many of the local towns by train quite easily. Uh, here on the left-hand side, uh, there's a, a specimen of wild tulip um, that she uh, uh, collected in uh, 1860, I think it was 61 here, um, and uh, from uh, Drybra Abbey to the east of Gatton side. And down below, there's a, there's a specimen of yellow water lily from the loch at the Haining, the large house called the Haining, which is just outside the town of Selkirk, which she, she collected in 1856. So there were, I think it provided other areas around Gattonside where, where Margaret could collect her samples. So I just want to move on now to where they moved later. The Dickinson family lived for about 10 years or so in Gattonside, where I believe they were renting, but they moved to a house that they bought in Norham, uh, about um, to the east um, of, um, to the east of Gattonside and about eight miles from Berwick-on-Tweed. Uh, uh, this is where um, I, I live at the moment. So, where I live is, is not very far from Tweed Villa in Norham, uh, where Margaret lived for the remainder of her life uh, from the late 1860s until she died in 19, uh, 1918. Again, I think the move to Norham um, brought about another spurt in collecting and for Margaret to paint many of the specimens that she found very much in the local area, in the, the different deans, Newbigan Dean um, and Morris Hall Dean, on the river banks of the River Tweed and some of the wet woods surrounding it. And this was a quite spectacular example of one of her pictures of hemp agrimony, which was collected just below Norham Castle uh, in 1869 very soon after they, they moved to this area. Now, um, sadly, both the, the parents, this, this time, the, whole, the Dickinson family was the parents, George and Elizabeth, the two, 
the two daughters, um, Margaret and Rebecca. Uh, in the early 70s, both parents died, leaving the two, the two sisters living on in Tweed Villa for the rest of both of their lives. Um, Margaret uh, continued very much um, over the next few years uh, with, uh, with her major hobby, her major interest in life uh, of, um, of, of botany, of collecting samples on a, and with her botanical drawings. And these are some of the field notes uh, that she did from uh, when she was in Norham. And you can see some of the, of the original field notes that are in the um, Hancock Museum. Uh, uh, this, on the right hand side here, you can see Solanum dul dulcimara, uh, which was um, from a hedge near the boathouse. Now, Tweed Villa was in um, Boathouse Lane, so this was very close uh, to the house where she lived. The next one down, you can see Anna Gallis. This was the riverside below the boathouse, the boathouse and the riverside going down to the Tweed River here. And then the third one, uh, Veronica Beckabunga, which uh, the notes say are common, uh, with milk white flowers in the ditch at Morris Hall. Well, Morris Hall is very close to the castle uh, in Norham. Um, and then lastly, Montana, uh, which was collected at Newbigan Dean. So there's some very precise locations uh, for some of the things she collected. Uh, very often with some of the others, you might just get a more general location, such as Holy Island, perhaps, um, or, um, uh, or perhaps uh, before uh, Gattonside. Uh, but here we have got the precision of that in her notes. Again, looking around Norham, this was a, a very uh, lovely painting that she did of the a blue anemone uh, that was collected very close uh, near Morris Hall uh, in 1872. So this was very soon after um, the family had moved to Norham. Uh, this is a naturalised European species. And you can see again how beautifully the painting shows up with the background chosen here um, by Margaret Dickinson and how the, the wonderful shadowing and shading brings the plant very much to life. Also, when um, Margaret Dickinson moved to Norham, um, she, she joined um, a naturalist club and the nearest one to where she was in Norham was the Berwickshire Naturalists, the, the BNC. Um, and she was admitted as an honorary member in 1873. Now, the, the, uh, the, nat the Berwickshire Naturalists um, was um, formed in 1831 by George, uh, George Johnston. And it was one of the very early field clubs, very similar to that of the, um, the uh, uh, the um, Naturalist Club of uh, Northumbria as well. Um, but uh, the, the BNC concentrated on field activities and a novel feature of it was that women members were, uh, were uh, right from the start, were allowed to be members, although they were only allowed in initially as honorary members. But Margaret joined uh, uh, several years later. And one of the things was that she was taken up very quickly uh, by Dr. James Hardy, who was the secretary of the club, and Mrs. Barwell Carter, who was the daughter of the founder, George Johnston. And that brought her pictures to the attention of many other uh, naturalists. And so she contributed on many occasions to different exhibitions of natural history. And she also had the opportunity to consult and collaborate with fellow naturalists. Um, Miss Dickinson's paintings 
were exhibited um, at the anchorage, which was the home of Mrs. Carter, uh, the daughter of, uh, of Dr. Johnston. And it was a social custom to invite members of the, uh, the BNC uh, to breakfast um, after their, um, their, their, the end of year meetings. And very often they had collections of different objects of natural history. Uh, and these included Margaret Dickinson's drawings, which were very much admired. And in the history of the Berwickshire Naturalist Club in 1873, uh, this is, this is recorded. It's also recorded in by the local, journal, local newspaper, the Berwickshire News in 1877, when Miss Dickinson's collection at the Anchorage showed how close a student of nature that lady is and her excellency as an amateur artist. So it was being, she was getting a wider audience at this stage. Uh, another um, record in the history of the Berkshire Naturalist Club uh, a few years later talked about uh, her beautiful paintings whose delineations of our flora have secured for her, for Miss Dickinson, a place in the very first rank of floral artists. And then later in a newspaper report in 1891, Miss Dickinson had on view her exquisite paintings of plants. So there is some recognition, but it is pos it really at a very local level at this time. Um, Miss Dickinson was also uh, involved in a field trip to Holy Island in 1874 that was organized by um, Dr. Hardy. And uh, Mrs. Carter also went along to this. And Miss Dickinson painted seven uh, specimens, collected seven specimens in 1874. Uh, this was one of them, a, a lesser water plantain. Uh, and this is uh, a native plant that at that time was found in small lowland pools and ponds. But it's now very rare and very scarce in this area today. Uh, they, the, the Seven specimens that were collected by Miss Dickinson um, inspired the contemporary uh, poet Linda France to write a poem, Portrait of the Artist as an Island Flower. And this was talking about the seven, um, the seven specimens of field garlic and brookweed, sea campion, beaked parsley, water plantain that we've just seen, knotted trefoil tufted century. And you can see here that she's trying to get the, the mysterious atmosphere of um, Holy Island and to uh, her poem gets this sort of atmosphere of this field trip that Miss Dickinson was on. And then later in the poem, the whole of the poem is in the accompanying book uh, to this talk, but later in the po poem, um, Linda Franz talks about the, some of the specimens are not scented, they're not seductive, and each one's a modest plant. And you can see here from two others of her specimens, a brookweed, a water pimpernel on the left here, and common beaked parsley. So again, the record that Margaret did of this field trip, it leads, leads seven very beautiful, but very modest uh, specimens that really evoke the mystery, I think, of, of Holy Island at that time. So more than a decade after her wildflower paintings had been completed, uh, Margaret Dickinson uh, embarked on a new enterprise when she concentrated instead on cultivated um, plants. And this was the paintings of daffodils, most of which she grew in her own garden at Tweed Villa in Norham, and some of which grew at Paxton um, by uh, a Mr Muirhead, who was the factor uh, of the Paxton estate at the time. Now this, um, this was part of, of the moment. It may well have been uh, that um, Margaret Dickinson was less inclined to travel 
more widely at this time. Perhaps her, she was becoming increasingly interested in gardening and the craze for daffodils that was uh, happening at the time in the country uh, overtook her uh, a little bit at that time. But there's 30 of her paintings which are slotted into an, to an album. Um, and this album, uh, then uh, we don't know what happened to it um, after about 1893, but it appeared at an auction house in Glasgow <clears throat> in 1996, where it was purchased um, by the Lindley Collection um, of the Royal Horticultural Society. And these are just a few of the 30 different um, uh, Narcissus that she painted. Now this was, um, this was from page 23 of the album and it was the Narcissus Oporto Yellow. And it was from a bulb from Peter Barr, who at that time was known as the Daffodil King. He collected a number of these daffodils um, from, um, from Spain and Portugal. This one was collected in around 1887, appeared in his catalogue in 1888, and Dickinson painted it in 1888 at Tweed Villa. So it shows that she was very keen and knew what was going on and was keen to get the bulbs from the catalogue and to grow them uh, in her own garden. This was, this was another of the um of the pages of the album page 14 which she drew um narcissus poeticus in 1886 and this actually the the um information um on the pictures gives quite a lot of detail here there were two hands um that were that uh, did some of the notes on the different paintings one of whom was Miss Dickinson, I think, and the other one possibly was Mr. Muirhead, whose garden, um, uh, where some of the bulbs came from, some of the gardens. But it, and this is probably Mr. Uh, Muirhead talking here. Miss Dickinson says the original roots were got at Prado Castle. Um, she grew them in her garden in Newcastle. She took the roots to Melrose about 1859. She was 11 years there and in 1869 took them to Norham. She thinks they're the old fashioned uh, Narcissus Poeticus of gardens. So it was a really very well traveled and probably very well loved uh, daffodil um, that uh, Miss Dickinson grew and drew. <laughs> and uh, this last, the last one from this, this was another uh, example and showing really a, a close up of the flower itself here. This was grown at Paxton and pa uh, Paxton, uh, but in Mr. Muirhead's garden, and it was painted by Miss Dickinson in 1888. And this, the description in the daffodil register talks about this particular daffodil have, having delicately pointed tips of the petals and the trumpet, the corolla is closely ribbed with frilling at the mouth. And when you look at her diagram, uh, her picture, you can see how closely she reflects this. And I think in a way that that shows that the, the um, how good a um, botanical artist uh, she was when you actually look at some of the descriptions in the Daffodil Register. And one of the other of her Narcissus, uh, is the type specimen for, um, uh, it's called Narcissus canby, uh, and it's now out of cultivation. And in the daffodil register, that Narcissus um, is, is shown, if it emerges again, if it's found again, the type specimen was drawn by Miss Dickinson. So that is, those, that gives a, a range of her, her different um, paintings, uh, displays the broad range of plants that she painted. But when you go back to the archive um, uh, in the Hancock Museum, you can also see some, her, some of her other natural history contributions and some of the paintings of uh, different fungi. 
and there's two of them here, but there are a number of different pages um, of fungi. And then just lastly, um, Miss Dickinson uh, um, uh, last painted uh, the daffodils in the 1890s, but she still continued uh, with her interest in natural history and last uh, went to a, 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 um, a, a scientific meeting of the Berwickshire Naturalist Club in 1908, when she was well into her 80s. In, uh, when she made her will, Miss Dickinson bequeathed her botan botanical collection of dried plants and my paintings of them, um, my collection of seaweeds and my paintings of fungi to the Hancock Museum, Newcastle upon Tyne, as well as any other articles of mine of scientific interest which the committee may choose to accept. And I think in a way this suggests that the wording, that she, although she thought her collection was important and she wanted it to, uh, to be seen uh, after her death, she, it conveys some modesty and really uncertainty about its value. So she would have been absolutely delighted with the comments of the curator's report of 1919 who's and the, the and in the report uh, that he made uh, this was e leonard gill's tribute the largest and in many ways the most remarkable acquisition of the year has come to us by bequest of the late miss m r dickinson of norham a lady who attained to an advanced age a boundless energy and unusual versatility. The bequest includes a great series of beautifully executed watercolour drawings of wild flowers, in itself a remarkable life work. So I think in a way, um, what I've tried to show uh, in this, uh, uh, this talk, um, that Margaret, Rebecca Dickinson merits much wider recognition as quite a significant regional artist, painting across Northumberland and the Scottish borders uh, and in other parts of the country as well. And I think her plant portraits uh, deserve a much wider scrutiny and attention. I think the bicentenary of Margaret's birth is perhaps a fitting time to recognise the remarkable life work that she achieved. So I think there's a full acknowledgement there. Um, last, anyone wishes to uh, know more about Margaret uh, Rebecca Dickinson, uh, the book can be purchased at the um, Hancock Museum shop or from the Berwickshire Naturalists Club website. The BNC published this particular book. And just to go back further, really would like to thank a number of different people, uh, including a special thanks to June Holmes, um, the archivist um, uh, at, at the Hancock Museum, and for her generous assistance and for her great knowledge about Margaret Rebecca Dickinson. I'd also like to thank James Common for setting up the Zoom presentation. So thank you very much, everyone.